Hello, in this video I'm going to be going through the engineering materials which is part of aeronautical engineering for HSC engineering studies or year 12 engineering studies. So we're doing materials as part of aeronautical engineering um, for yeah, year 12. So I will be referencing a little bit um, Paul Copeland's engineering studies, the definitive guide volume two. This is the third edition I have here, but um, there is now, I think, a fourth edition. I recommend that one. Uh, now, what am I going to be talking about? I'm going to be focusing specifically on some testing. Now, I've talked about testing many times, so already my students should by this stage have a pretty good idea of testing. Specifically, we've talked a lot about dye penetration. We've already talked a lot about um, X-ray and, X and gamma rays. We have maybe not talked as much about magnetic. I think I asked my class and they were less confident about um, magnetic particle and ultrasonic testing. We're going to go talk about aluminium. Now, we've already talked about aluminium in the previous chapter, uh, specifically the seven classifications of aluminium, and uh, which is what we're looking at here. So we've got aluminium, silicon, magnesium, copper. These three here that are being called out are the heat treatable ones. Uh, we're also going to be looking at the heat treatment specifically relating to uh, we're going to be looking at precipitation hardening in this. So when we talk about changes in the property, changing in structure, that's what we're talking about. Uh, so thermosetting properties. Now we have talked about thermosetting properties way back in chapter one of year, um, way back in chapter one of prelim. Uh, but we will have a look at that again. And what we're going to be looking at is the new stuff is we're going to be looking at compression molding, hand and vacuum layup, um, and then we're going to be looking at composites. Specifically, we're going to be looking at FMLs. And the main one that we're going to be focusing on is glare, which is used in the A380. And we're going to be talking about corrosion. We've already, we have already did corrosion back in civil structures, uh, but we're going to be focusing on pit and crevice and um, prevention in aircraft. So uh, let's uh, get going. So the first thing I have is testing. So for testing, this is my uh, notes, or at least currently it's seven, um, 752. And it might change to 952 or something like that. Uh, and I've got all of my testing here. Any current for some reason just refuses to add in that space. Uh, but let's have a look at the ones we specifically are interested in. We're interested in X-rays to start off with. So X-ray radiation is a high energy form of electromagnetic radiation. So it's in the, um, the magnetic spectrum. And we the if we order the spectrum, oh, actually it would be great if I had the spectrum. Here we go. Okay, so we've got uh, gamma rays have the highest frequency and shortest wavelength. X-rays, UV light, the visible light, infrared, microwave, um, FM radios, AM radios, long wave radios. So gamma rays have the most energy. So they're ionizing radiation, which makes them dangerous. And the fact that they're high, such high frequency it means that they're stronger, they're more penetrating. So to help us remember which one is stronger, we remember that Hulk, whose form, Hulk was created from gamma radiation. He's also green, if that helps you to remember. G for green, G for gamma. Anyway, um, that... Hulk is the strongest there is. He is stronger than Wolverine, who is an X-Man. So um, we can have a look at a video of that. Uh, it's worth mentioning that radiation is dangerous. This is ionizing radiation, which means it strips the uh, electrons off your atoms. That's no good. Um, causes cancer and things. Um, but the idea is because it can penetrate through objects, we can detect it, and we can use that to determine the density of... Um, of an object, we can use that to find subsurface cracks. So we can use that to model and say, oh, there's a void there. And it's very important to mention, particularly in welding, that usually a random percentage of um, uh, welder, welders, when they weld, a random sample of their work gets x-rayed to see whether or not it's, um, it's free of defects. OK, so the next we're going to look at is dye penetration testing. And with dye penetration testing, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to clean the object. And so we can see that there's a crack there because it's a diagram. And we're going to spray it with dye, which is going to penetrate. And they've used the term apply penetrant. And that um, goes into the crack. We're going to allow it to soak. We wash it off. We then spray on a developer, that foam. And the crack will then spread out. It will be absorbed into the foam and we'll be able to see it. So here we have an object. Where it's got the dye washing the penetrant away. Um, it'll give it 10 minutes to actually set in and then spraying the developer, the foam, and then we can see I've got this at five times speed. So, you know, we're seeing this thing pretty quickly, but we can see that crack just form 
So that's pretty cool. Uh, there we have the advantages and disadvantages. It can be used on lots of things. It's fairly cheap. It's only suitable for surface defects. Um, you can't tell how deep the floor is. Okay, rough surfaces are difficult to test. Okay, moving on to magnetic particle tests. So the idea here is we put the object in a um, magnetic field and we cover it with iron filings. The iron filings will be attracted to cracks that form on the uh, on the test piece. If we put that in, uh, if we put a fluorescent additive into there and we put it in UV light, those cra those filings are really easy to see. So that's what we've got going on there. Um, there's a diagram, but again, I have these videos all linked in the, the thing, so I don't need to go into too much detail. So we have ultrasonic testing. In this case, what's happening is we're measuring how long it takes um, sound, a sound wave, to reach the bottom or, or to, to find a change in density and then reflect back. So based on how long it takes, we can then determine, we can calculate what the distance was each way. So at the moment, it's saying, well, this object, based on how long it took me to um, to go and come back, it must be 200 millimeters each way. That's how big this sample must be. And then as the uh, sensor is, uh, well, the emitter and the sensor is passing, now that sound is traveling a lot shorter of a distance before it's bouncing back. So it's about 120 mil. So it's saying, hey, there's something here at 120 mil. I think there's a defect. And then as we pass over the defect, it will go back to 200. Okay, and then when we go here, we're going to see, oh, there's a defect at 90 mil, and that starts to show up. So that's how we use ultrasonic testing. Okay, um, the, this, again, if you go over the, the end of it, it will talk about advantages and disadvantages at the end. Um, uh, and their applications. But the point is that uh, this is useful because it help, allows us to determine it's non-destructive and it allows us to find subsurf subsurface defects. Okay, moving on. Uh, now, this is from my previous topic. This is from transport, so transport materials, where I've talked about aluminium. And I talked a fair bit about aluminium. And it's Copeland in the textbook talks about aluminium on page 127. And then we're going to pick it up again. So uh, we have a little bit of a, if you want some text rather than my video or my links, uh, magnetic particle, gamma rays. Um, we've got aluminum used in aircraft. We've got three series here, the 2000, 6000, 7000 series. And he mentions um, aluminum lithium. And it's just because the particular weight saving is particularly important in uh, uh, military aircraft. We're also going to talk about Alclad which is a, um, I think it's applications primarily in aviation. So if we go back to my, um, this helps me, it's a mnemonic, it helps me to remember the uh, the 7000 series. I have to remember this stuff as a teacher, and for me to, to remember this, I found that you know, making this picture helped me to remember. So first of all, we've got the 1000 series, and I have that from a, an ad, um, it was a, a drink, something about pure. And so pure aluminium is has less than one, remember ads? I mean, I guess you have ads on YouTube now. Anyway, 1% defects, right? So it has to be 99% pure aluminium if it's 1,000. So if, the, if it's a four-digit number that starts with a one, it has to be 1% um, maximum um, defect. Uh, not defects, no additives. It has to be 99% pure aluminium. If it's 2,000 series, that means it contains copper. Um, so there I have the two-cent coin, um, Obviously, we don't use two-cent coins anymore, but once upon a time we did, and they were made out of copper. The 3000 series is um, manganese, so it's a mango. We don't really talk about that one very much. 4000 series, I've got four silly skeletons. Some uh, My original version of this diagram, I had uh, the Chinese se, which is spelled S-I, which means for or death, depending on the tone. So if it's se or se, um, and that's why they have superstitions. But anyway, that's, the se means for or, yeah, anyway. Um, SI is four in Chinese. That's that's the point, yeah. SI is four in Chinese. Silicon is SI. That's the yeah the the um. Feel free to ask questions. Okay, for five or six, well, there's a movie called Dirty Harry, and I, actually, I don't even think the first one's called Dirty Harry. But the point is, there's a movie, and in this movie, this guy called Harry, he has a big gun called a Magnum, and he asks the question of um, a criminal. He says, "I know what you're thinking. Did I fire five shots or six? Well, look, you know, the question you've got to ask yourself is, do you feel lucky? Now, you'd feel pretty silly if you're pointing a big gun at someone and you'd already fired all six shots, right? So in both cases, you have the magnesium or the magnum, um, 
I could do this with like ice creams. I know what you're thinking. Did I eat five ice creams or six? Right. But if you, before you go to the uh, freezer, the question you've got to ask yourself is, you know, do you feel lucky? Anyway, um, but if you're already eating all six, you're going to feel pretty silly. So that's six is silicon and magnesium. Um, seven is zinc. Now, um, there is a free, lo uh, free floss. Free, what's L? Libre. Free Libre open source software called 7-Zip that you can use to extract zipped files. And um, the another way, if you don't use 7-Zip, to remember this is that you could think of the number 7 can be written over the Z, right? So the number 7 can be written over the Z, and that gives you um, zinc. Um, okay, so pure copper, manganese, silicon, both of these have magnesium, but six is magnesium with silicon, and seven is zinc. Now, um, the properties of this are discussed in Copeland's textbook, right? And he goes at where these, are, like where the applications for these are. All I'm really going to focus on, because I try to focus on the things that are likely to be asked, uh, I'm going to focus on um, two, six, and seven. Why do we focus on two, six, and seven? Because they are heat treatable or they can be precipitation hardened. Now, specifically, if we're going to start with the 2000 series, um, Duralumin, right, which is 2017, um, which was formerly used. Now we tend to use um, 2024. Uh, these, um, they are very commonly used in aviation. However, the weakness is that although copper makes steel more corrosion resistant, it makes aluminium much more susceptible to corrosion. It's bad, right, in, in aluminium. So let's go to uh, this um, post here, which I, I, I like about uh, aluminium. And this is in our notes as well. And it says that aluminium will always be thought of as the metal that allowed people to fly. Um, it's light, strong, and flexible. We're not allowed to say strong. We have to say, we would say in this context, it has a good tensile strength or a good fatigue strength, something like that. Um, Apparently, according to this, it makes up 70 to 80% of modern aircraft. Um, it was first used by Ferdinand Zeppelin, and um, it allowed the Wright brothers to fly, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, so, and there's a special mention to Duralumin or 2017, 2024. Uh, here they've got the series, which are written in these notations. Um, it says, you know, it specifies where three fives and sixes are used in low loads. Whereas we use um, sevens are used for lower temperature environments. Anyway, uh, the most widely used alloy is seven, 7075, which consists of aluminium and zinc with a bit of other stuff. Um, it's the strongest of all aluminium alloys and comparable with respect to that of steel. Again, we're not allowed to say strong. We would say it has the highest tensile strength. Um, okay. However, or actually a better way of phrasing, because we're talking about the mass or the density, what we might say is it has a very good, um, has a comp com comparable tensile strength, but because it's much lighter, so we would say it has a um, higher specific strength or strength to weight strength to weight ratio than steel. Okay, um, there's some more stuff here that's worthwhile, worth reading. Um, I still have students who haven't handed in their assignment yet, so they might use that um, in, in their uh, assessment task. But um, it's already in our notes. If we go to Duralumin, it talks about how it's known as Avianol in France. I don't know why I feel the need to point that out. Um, 2017, these days we use 2024. Um, 2024 talks about its basic properties. So it has density, it has a Young's modulus, which is measures its stiffness. Um, does it have its tensile strength? A yield strength of at least... 270 to 280 megapascals, where we say that we say that mild steel has a yield strength of about 300 megapascals. I don't think you're likely to have to remember that, but if you say that um, geranium has a high strength to rate ratio, that that would be a good uh, good answer. Now we're also going to talk about our clad. We'll come back to our clad when we talk about corrosion resistance, but our clad is where we take a 2000 series aluminium and we coat it in a one percent layer, like a thick one percent thickness of um, 1000 series. And the reason for that is the 1000 series is very corrosion resistant, whereas the 2000 series is susceptible to corrosion. So we, by using our clad where we coat it, the yellow here represents 1000 series. 
um, or we can use the 7000 series. But we, we, we're just for the sake of the textbook, it talks about our clad. It says it uses um, 2000 series and it is done. Uh, they're rolled together. Pressure welding um, the joints of layers. The, the aluminum sheet generally counts for 1% of the total thickness of the two. So it's saying the aluminum, the pure, the 1000 series represents about 1% of the thickness. Okay, moving on. So we'll talk more about aluminum. So we said that the Wright brothers, they used uh, aluminum um, in their Wright flyer. And it's in this video here, we have real engineering saying that no engineer uh, and no engine existed at the time that matched the power to weight rate requirements that they needed. So what they, they built their own engine. They built it out of the wonder material of the time, which only been widely used for, I think we say that aluminum was first developed. It's somewhere on the board there. I think 1870 is what I've got for aluminum cans directly above Sputnik. 1870? 1880. Okay, pretty close. Um, 1886? Yeah, so only 20 years old um, or less than 20 years old when the Wright brothers were working. So it was a real new cutting edge material. And um, they painted it black so that people didn't steal their ideas. So people didn't know what this wonder material was that they were using. If we move later into the video, it, we find out that Alfred Wilm, he... Um, tried to temper, um, like quench temper aluminium, but it didn't work. And in his frustration, according to Real Engineering, he went away on the weekend and he came back and he found that over the weekend it improved. It had got, um, become uh, stronger and harder. Remember, we're not allowed to say stronger. I know that it's functionally very useful in language to be able to refer to things comparatively using the word stronger, but for some reason, engineering studies does not seem to like it in the marking. Um, anyway, and this led to precipitation hardening. So I have the University of Oregon. I think that this is a pretty good video, um, well explained. And in this video, um, we um, just, we talk about how we have the formation of what we want to find is what the end product that we're looking for is microscopic precipitates that form within a single alpha phase of aluminum. That's what we're looking for. And we produce that, like I said, from this three-step process. We um, we heat treat, we quench, we precipitation heat treat. Um, or age is the term we use there. So that, that's explained in this video. Um, and we also have, um, so a local teacher, if anyone's looking for a tutor, um, and former metallurgist, or I don't know, metallurgist, I guess once a metallurgist, always a metallurgist, uh, he has two videos talking about precipitation hardening. He talks about two different aspects. Uh, he talks about properties here, and he talks about the specific crystal um, function here. So the idea is that if we're talking about 2000 series, we have small amounts of copper that are added to the crystal or the matrix. But, well, what happens? Initially, when we cool, what happens is we form a precipitate. Now, when we talk about alloys, what we're talking about is a solid solution. Now, we've talked before that a solution could be when we stir sugar into our tea or when we have water vapor in the air. Now, as the temperature drops and the pressure changes, the water vapor that's stored in the air starts to fall out of the air, and we call that word rain, right? That's Rain is a precipitation that forms. Or that if you change the, the um, heat and pressure of our tea, we can actually, or if we stir in too much, we can form a precipitate that forms at the bottom of the tea. The sugar will start to form on the bottom. What happens here is that as we cool, our aluminium, what will happen is we'll actually have two phases. So we'll have um, an alpha and beta phase. And that phase, it forms the grain boundaries. That's not particularly useful for us. What we can do is when we soak the um, when we heat it back up, those copper atoms will, f will be evenly distributed throughout the entire um, aluminium crystal. And that's OK. But the problem is what we really want is we want little clumps. We want clumps of three or four atoms at a time. Clumps of three or four atoms is what gives us the biggest disruption to the lattice, which improves our hardness and improves our tensile strength. So if we look at that in this diagram, uh, again, back to real engineering, he talks about that the precipitation hardening dis uh, takes the previously equal, evenly distributed um, copper, right? So here we have copper disrupting the lattice. And but then what it does is it moves them towards a central location so we have to say three in this little clump and that disruption is much more um, effective in improving the hardness and the material properties of our um, aluminium okay we have some hsc questions on precipitation hardening 
in this particular paper in 2017, they gave us two questions. They gave us a um, multiple choice where they said which one can be described as solution treating, quenching, and then reheating. The answer is D, precipitation hardening. And then they give us a question that says, in a modern aircraft, the external skin is riveted to the frame using treated and quenched aluminium, copper alloy rivets. These rivets are then allow, um, used immediately to attach the external skin to the frame. Describe the processes that, um, that change the structure in these three rivets. Now, first of all, I'll say this was a bit of a shock when I read it, um, when I was sitting out there waiting. I get the paper after two hours and I try and do it as quickly as I can. And I'm like, oh, that's a, that was a bit of a, I thought a tough question. But I would think, well, hopefully my students would know that if we're talking about aluminium with 4% copper, well, I'm going to give you, I didn't mark this, right? I didn't mark this paper. I don't even know if I was marking this here. In, in, uh, anyway, not, not the point. The point is um, I would expect my students to know that aluminium with some amount of copper is 2000 series. So if you wrote aluminium such as 2000 series or if you wrote 2017 or like 2XXX, or if you wrote duralumin, if you said copper such as duralumin um, contains copper and can be precipitation hardening, hardened, that's at least one mark. I personally would be giving that two marks already because you've demonstrated two pieces of information. You've identified the um, the kind of copper alloy and you've, you've been able to talk about the process is precipitation hardening. Now, for the third mark, I would say that by... Um, by quenching and reheating, we for allow... Uh, we dissolve the alpha and beta phase and we get a single alpha phase with the copper is evenly distributed and then when it's allowed to age what will happen is that the copper will form precipitates which improve the hardness and strength of the, yeah it's strength oh, you really should qualify it as tensile strength of the of the rivet yep that's the answer i would give I think that's a pretty good answer for three marks. You can look at the answers because these are HSC questions. You can look at the answers on your own time. Okay, here we have a question here, another multiple choice question. This was three years later, but by this stage, I was not surprised. This By this point, I'm like, no, we absolutely should know precipitation hardening. And we can see here we have an alpha phase with little clumps of beta phase on the grain boundary. And here we see microscopic, right? They point out here that alpha is microscopic somewhere, I think. Um, does it say that? the sorry the beta phase is microscopic anyway the answer is precipitation hardening totally fair question um okay so moving on to the next um thing here so i have aeronautical materials and i've really just focused on the stuff that's new um so i haven't got a, talked about aluminium i haven't talked about polymers um in my, i've only talked about the new stuff on polymers uh what i would like i said including glare but i really i think this video might be my richard hammond video probably Let's have a look. It is. Okay, so um, let's keep going. So first of all, I've got this question here on nylon. So nylon is a thermosofting polymer. It's polyamide. It's one of the um, or aramids. It is one of, I mean, that's me making a call. I hope I pronounced that correctly on the internet. Um, so it's a thermosofting polymer. Remember how we talk about uh, polymers one to six, they all have names. Polymer seven can be um, headlights and taillights. So headlights are poly, um, polycarbonate, taillights um, acrylic or PMMA. Uh, we have the two things that we 3D print. So we have ABS and PLA. And then I have Kevlar, Kevlar fibers, which is um, nylon or nylon or Kevlar or PA, polyamide or aramid. I hope that I'm right there. I'm going out on a limb there. So if we look at our syllabus though, it says specifically we're looking at composites including Kevlar, carbon fiber. So when they say Kevlar, what they Kevlar is a trade name. Uh, I think nylon's a trade name. I think it comes from the use in stockings and the because uh, the fashion world was based in New York and London. That's why it's called nylon. So a better a better um, question would have said a you know poly, polymer or polyamide. Uh, propeller, but I'm happy with nylon. It's fine. I, I'm not questioning that. Nylon propellers are used in drones, um, whereas carbon fiber composite polymers are used in commercial air aircraft. Describe suitable manufacturing um, method for each type of polymer uh, propeller. Um, okay, so first of all, if we're talking about any polymer, we can. The, if you're if in doubt, 
right injection molding. It is absolutely the most commonly used. I, I can see that some students were waiting for that word for injection molding. It is absolutely the most commonly used manufacturing process when we talk about polymers. So I have uh, this video here that I think does a good job of showing uh, thermo softening. Is it tapered? It doesn't look tapered. Um, does it have a hopper or not? Anyway, the point is the slightly different depending on if we're using um, thermo softening or thermo setting. I think this video does a good job. Um, and then it's cooled and released. So we have the concepts like runners and risers, um, flashing, sprues, um, that sort of stuff. Okay, uh, sprue and treat. And I, we have... Um, that engineering guy, um, Bill Hammack, he has a great video on, which I, by this stage, my class has made, seen me talk about maybe four times. So he has a great 10 minute video talking about, and that's actually the screw. That's an actual size screw from an injection molding machine. Um, okay. When we're talking about thermosetting polymers, so what we have is vulcanized rubber is an example of uh, where we can see the natural rubber that we use uh, that we have access to is a um, thermo softening polymer which means that we have a covalent a very very long strings of covalent bonds right polymers and long chains of carbon compounds each one is called a monomer the monomers don't have to be the same in this case we've got this long chain of carbon compounds and what we can do uh, but that's for thermo softening polymers imagine if we had a whole bunch of ropes those ropes are free to move around from each other, or chains is actually a better analogy, right? But if I start padlocking some of those chains together, suddenly it's very difficult for us to move those chains around. And that's what we're looking at here. In this case, the padlocks in um, vulcanized rubber is using um, disulfide, so two, two um, atoms of sulfur, which create crosslinks, three-dimensional covalent crosslinks that join those long polymer chains. Okay, moving on. So this is the injection molding process for thermosetting polymers, right? So feedstock is fed into a hopper. The feed is then fed into a barrel until sufficient melt has built up the front of the screw. The fill shot is injected into the mold and allowed to cool, uh, to cool right? That's three marks. Um, minimum, the green is the minimum for three marks. If you wanted to be fancy, you could write the extra stuff. Okay, so the syllabus also asks us to talk about, um, where is that? It talks about compression molding. So let's have a look at compression molding. Okay, we've got in, um, impact in extrusion and we've got compression molding. So, uh, and transfer molding. I am not going to go through, spend forever reading through someone else's textbook, at least not you know, at this point. Um, you know, I, I have in other videos, but here you can read this. We have the textbook, so we can, um, we can read that and um, compare them. So, uh, sorry, impact extrusion. Oh, am I going to edit that? Nah. Okay, so why I have this is, I think in my notes, I make the comparison where I say that it's similar to impact extrusion, but it's not the same concept. So that's where I'm going with. Okay, so impact extrusion is something that we looked at in chapter two, where we saw that we can get a die to move around the punch. But when we're talking about compression molding, it's a similar concept, except we're not using metals, we're using polymers. Okay, so um, we have the unpolymerized preform, which we compress using heat. Uh, the heat and pressure make it, um, cause it to take the shape of the mold. It's then ejected. Um, and transfer molding, similar to compression molding, uh, we happen, it happens in an adjacent cavity. Uh, it is used for molding thermosets. Okay. Now, this is the thing that really matters. This is when we saw that propeller question, we said, what about for carbon fiber reinforced polymer? For carbon fiber reinforced polymers, we have three options. We have hand layup and um, we have this concept of pre-preg, pre-preg bags, or we can, and we can have oven cured pre-preg, which I guess we could say we have two options, but one of them is uses an autoclave, which is a cool and expensive um, uh, machine. So if we, or at least it used to be expensive when I last looked up how much they were, like they were as much as a small car. Okay, so first of all, what you can do is you can buy a sheet of um, carbon fiber 
And you can just make something with a shape just by gluing on your, brushing on your resin, right? And so that's what we can see this person's doing here. We get quite a smooth finish if that's on the glass, and then we can just lay, put more and more layers on until we're happy. And um, we get a solid sheet. Now, then what we can also do is we can vacuum the, uh, so you can see they're setting up the vacuum bag. And that's going to get rid of all the air, and we're going to get a very strong material out of that. Now we're going to get some more sheet. This time we're going to, um, oh, so we can use uh, pre-pregnated uh, bags, and then we can stick them in this the autoclave. And the autoclave, sorry, I've got it so fast that it's hard to see, because um, oven oven cured pre-preg is um, where we use the autoclave. The autoclave has pressure and temperature, which gives us even better results than just the vacuum um, the vacuum bag. Okay, so if we're talking, uh, I'll show you one more. So here we have um, this is a Kawasaki Ninja part. So we've got our mold, they've got the sheets. Now this sheet, um, I think is, is pre-preg, it's already got the glue impregnated onto it. You didn't need to hand lay that up. They've molded it to the, to the frame. You can see they're, they're getting ready to bag up the, so the tape is there to bag up the, the pre-preg. And they're vacuuming it. Is there an autoclave? I don't remember. Don't think so. Okay, and then they're finishing. So sanding it off for finishing. I don't think there's an autoclave there. I'm not gonna watch all the way to the end, but I have that video in our notes. Uh, we'll quickly go back to Copeland, see what he has to say about things. So we've already seen those notes there. We're gonna look at composites. Uh, so gas fiber reinforced um, polymer, so fiberglass. So, I mean, surfing's pretty common at the school that I teach. So uh, people have a pretty good idea about the concept of fiberglass. The idea we have glass fibers held together in a thermo setting resin. Remember, whenever we see, hear the word resin or epoxy, there's a good chance that we're talking about um, polymers. Uh, sorry, thermo setting polymers. Actually, which brings me to my notes here. So polyurethane, also abbreviated as PUR, is an often alternative to leather. It is used in foams and sponges, hoses, wheels, things like skateboard wheels, and is used as something and sealants um adhesives and sealants it is a copolymer so it is a copolymer it has two different parts that make it up two different monomers phenyl formaldehyde um, is used as the basis for bakelite it was the first commercial synthetic polymer it was used for billiard balls countertops and as a an adhesive such as brake pads it is both a copolymer and a condensation polymer so i've got that the year 11 book page 25 so it shows that it produces a byproduct which is water. Resins and epoxies. Generally, anything with the word epoxy or resin is going to be a thermoset. Elastomers are polymer. Um, elastomers are polymers that display rubber-like elasticity. They are usually thermosets produced by um, vulcanization, which cr uh, creates cross-linking. Silicone with an e is used in waterproof sealants and phone covers. Vulcan vulcanized rubber is used in. Um, Yeah, in, in tires. Sorry, things. Um, sulfur creates crosslinks, strengthening the natural rubber. I've got the um, thermo the thermo setting polymer, and then I've got blow molding, vacuum forming. Okay, so we're done with that. Um, okay, so carbon reinforced polymer, um, one of the most important um, innovations in the aircraft industry. So the Dreamliner, the seven eight seven is predominantly made from carbon reinforced po um, polymers. Uh, one disadvantage is that they are brittle with no plastic failure. It means they give no warning prior to failure, but we're gonna see some advantages to them in our notes. Uh, aramid fibers, we talked about Kevlar and we talked about nylon and um, it gives very, very high tensile strength. It provides tensile strength to the um, object. Okay, uh, fiber metal laminates, which we're gonna look at uh, glare, which is glass, laminate, aluminum reinforced epoxy, but we haven't got to that yet. Okay, oh, maybe we have. Um, there was one thing I wanted to look at, sorry. Um, composites, reinforced polymers, uh, CFRP. Um, 
I should point out pre-preg stands for pre-impregnated so that the glue is already already in the sheet before you start. You don't have to brush it on. Um, polymide fibers, polyester resin. Yeah, okay. I just, just I guess I'm just going to keep going. Um, okay, so here we've got an FML question. Um, so aircraft skins can be constructed using either FMLs or um, sheet aircraft grade aluminum alloy. FML is preferred because it has, I would guess, a higher strength to weight ratio and improved fatigue resistance. D would be my guess there. Um, I don't have the answer circled, so um, that's I think seems pretty good. Okay, I've also got this question here. This one here is about oh, this is relevant to the propeller question sorry about that so it talks about vacuum layup um so it talks about carbon fiber sheet is laid into a mold assembly is placed into a vacuum bag it's placed into an autoclave autoclave where it's evacuated so the vacuum all the air out heated and allowed to, to set nylon um they're injection molded that's exactly what i said and i've already talked about what the injection molding process looks like okay so um, we said the Dreamliner is made out of CFRP, so the 787. The A380 was made out of glare. It's predominantly made out of glare. Um, so it's an FML. And I have a video on the A380 where uh, Richard Hammond is going to shoot chickens at a piece of glare. Previously, he shot at aluminium and the chicken, it's a frozen chicken, um, ah, didn't break, whereas previously it did break. Um, and then he talks about somewhere else in this video about how... He, um, it's similar to the composite bows used by Mongols, but what we're actually interested in is glare. So glare, we said, stands for glass reinforced laminate. There's different abbreviations. I like that, um, but also um, glass resin aluminium uh, reinforced. Uh, anyway, so it's an FML. Uh, so it uses glass fiber prepreg bonded together with a matrix such as an epoxy, so some thermosetic polymer and between sheets of aluminium what does it have better damage tolerance so impact and uh, metal fatigue resistance so toughness it has better corrosion resistance better fire resistance and lower specific weight right um or so means it's lighter it has better density the specific weight just being another word uh, effectively another word for density i've got, so it's in five layers like a big mac where we've got aluminium bread and prepreg or um carbon fiber reinforced polymers as the meat of the sandwich uh, okay so last week moving on to aeronautical corrosion and what we the th two things you need to be able to do so after reading copeland reading these pages and the re two review the review questions um 30 or three review questions i then want you to explain pit and crevice corrosion and what is stress corrosion so um I've also got a HSC question here, and I've got two HSC questions. So I've got some different notes there. Um, I've got my definition. Pit and crevice corrosion is a concentration cell. We previously learned about concentration cells. The idea that when we have a, a scratch, we're going to have an area of low oxygen down below and an area of high oxygen on the top of the scratch. And we know that the low area of low oxygen is going to be the anode. So the angry ox, why is he angry? He's angry because he's got low oxygen levels. Um, now, uh, there's some more information there talking about dew point and things like that. That's a little bit more ex ex extension. I expect you to read this um, later. But uh, stress corrosion, cracking, we talked about stress. So again, the anode, angry ox, why is he angry? He's angry because he's stressed. So the anode is going to be the point that is stressed. Um, cathodic protection can be used to prevent stress corrosion cracking. Um, I have some videos, again, from um, high school engineering teacher and cabinet maker and he describes wet and dry corrosion versus localized corrosion and he goes into a little bit more detail about pitting and things like that um and i have a past hsc question i think i have another past hsc question where's this one? Oh, okay identify the factors that contribute to stress corrosion cracking in aluminium alloy aircraft components so two two part question so we can say that areas of high stress are more likely to 
um, become the anode and therefore corrode. Also, we can say that additional factors such as scratches where we have a concentration cell can contribute to um, corrosion. You could even talk about um, things like alclad because it's coated in pure aluminium. It means that it's more corrosion resistant, um, forming a protective oxide layer or something like that. Okay. Um, you can have a look at because past its hsc question you can have a look and see what their wording was i'm doing off this off the top of my head okay so this question was a question last year in the hsc i thought this was simultaneously a good and bad question um so when i went through my daughter did the hsc last year i went through the question with her and um i'm like oh what did you put and she said oh, i went with dissimilar metals i'm like oh yeah okay i would have gone with uh, stress corrosion because it's a point of higher stress and then when I got to marking and I was talking to the other senior markers, they're like, oh, yeah, but there's a gap there. So there's going to be a concentration cell. And in the end, we decide, well, I, I, my understanding is that the markers um, marked all three is correct, which is great, right? I think that makes for a great question where, you know, it's a question where as long as you run with something and you give a good answer, you're going to be okay. So let's have a look at their answer. They said, um, the type well so answers could include dissimilar metals in contact so the rivets being a different material to the sheet it could be um i'm going to skip that one it could be pit corrosion could be crevice corrosion could be stress corrosion so i'm pretty happy with that and they've got an answer there um talking about that so um yeah so they've said dissimilar metals right was their example um so different options there which i think makes for a pretty cool question okay um so it says i've got oh i wrote, did just talk about this this question um okay and i opened it already okay lastly this is not really strictly in the syllabus here except for the fact that it talks about when i go to syllabus it says um stress corrosion cracking so just to cover cracking um as part of an inspection that when you identify a crack what you can do to prevent further crack propagation is you can drill a circle at the end of the crack. This creates a much larger surface area so that the forces are not likely to um, continue to propagate. So, um, whereas otherwise the tip of the crack is the weak point and just keeps spreading like a spearhead. Um, okay, so if we go back over this now, I can say that I will have talked about uh, dye penetration, X ray and gamma. We talked about other non destructive tests, particle and ultrasonic. We looked at aluminium. We looked at um, 2000. 6,000 and aluminum copper, sorry, that was uh, 4,000, 6,000 and 2,000 series. Um, we also talked about uh, lithium as well uh, in AVA, in, uh, okay, and also al alclad, which I could probably even put in there as an alclad as a note. Uh, we talked about why we use these alloys. I talked about them very briefly. I just said these three are heat treated. But if you want more details, you can look specific. I also said 7,000 has the highest tensile strength. Um, but you can have a look at Copeland where he has more detailed notes. We talked about the um, changes in the microstructure and microstructure when we talked about precipitation hardening. Um, we talked about thermosetting polymers. We talked about how we can use um, injection molding um, as a, that's our go-to, but for aviation, we tend to use, especially when we're using um, carbon fiber and we in the CFRP, we can use hand layup, which is where we brush on the resin or we can use prepreg, which is already got the resin in it, and we can use vacuum layup where we put it in a bag and um, the vacuum helps fuse the fuse the, the resin, and we can put it in an alclave where it uses temperature and pressure to give a high quality finish. Um, we talked about composites. Um, we talked about Kevlar, which we said is an aramid. Um, we talked about carbon fiber CFRP. Uh, we talked about FMLs, we talked about glare. So we said that the Dreamliner, which these two planes were developed at the same time, the Dreamliner uses CFRP. Uh, maybe that's what I was looking for. Somewhere, um, if I go to real engineering, that's what I wanted. So um, in this video, which I'm sure I've talked about, I think I talk about this in the history video, is where I talk about it. Um, he talks about the windows. And he says, why are the windows so... Actually, that's what the, the windows... That's what it's called. He has a video called, why are the windows so big? Um, 
And the answer is because they use carbon fiber. Carbon fiber has good fatigue resistance. So it means you can have a bigger opening. Uh, he talks about the pressurization of the CFRP. Um, so let me see if I can find that. So yeah, he so says the changing pressure puts um, fatigue stress on the material. Um, carbon fiber has good fatigue resistance. But the problem that he said, the downside is that it has brittle failure, which means that we don't really understand, you know, its failure mode uh, as well as we could. Um, they talk about testing and things like that. So I've already talked about that in another video. So, um, but I, I'm glad that I've got it covered somewhere. I'm glad I did this this you know, conclusion. This is why you do conclusion. So you remember what you talked about. Um, okay, and then we talked about uh, corrosion. Specifically, we talked about um, yeah pit and cro uh, stress corrosion cracking. Now, preventing cro corrosion. How do we prevent corrosion in, in aviation? What's the primary primary method? Drill a hole. That's cracking. Our clad. Yeah, the no, it's good. I, look, I'm, I'd rather have people that give answers than not. Um, so our clad is where we, we coat it in pure aluminium because our pure aluminium has a protective oxide layer which. Um, doesn't have when it corrodes, it doesn't continue to corrode. Yep. Is there any corrosion between the two metals? Uh, so the question is: Is there any corrosion between the two metals? Because we've got um, the, the one thousand series and the two thousand series, I would say that if there's cracking, I'm talking outside my area of expertise, so I'm always cautious of that. That's a good question for you to investigate. But if I had to take a guess, I would say that if there's cracking, um, uh, scratches that you know, that expose both metals, then yes, potentially. But you've got to remember that planes have very, very high levels of maintenance, so we see we find those cracks and those, those scratches uh, more readily. Um, but uh, it, if we look here, it says it's common for us to have like wax and other coatings to prevent corrosion, like so prevent that scratching. Um, but yeah, I could see potentially. If the, it, whenever we have two different metals in contact, if there's a, a water or anything to allow the transfer of electrons, then yeah, there will be dissimilar metals. But ultimately, we, we deal with that by wax coatings and um, regular inspection and maintenance. Okay, well, thank you very much. I hope that was worthwhile.